So um, to get started, um, Mary, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself so folks know who you are. And... Yep, I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor of literacy at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I have been here for about five years. And before that, I did my doctoral work at the University of Kansas. And I worked in the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities, which was a federally funded contract to um, sort of learn about the lay of the land um, in terms of students with disabilities. And a lot of my research is about access and accessibility in online learning environments. And I got asked to be the editor in chief or to, you know, to apply actually to be the editor in chief by the former um, co-editors, Leanna Archambault and Jared Borup. And I had done some special issues for them for this journal. And then they were looking around after their, they did two different terms <laughs> as editors and they were looking around and were like, hey, let's let's find, let's ask Mary to do this. And then, um, and then I really wanted to work with Michael. And so I was glad that they were able to convince him to come on. Yeah, so I'm Mike Barber, and I am um, an associate professor of instructional design at Toro University, California in Vallejo. Um, I've been researching in the field now for about, I think this is year 23 uh, since I did my first study in the field. Um, and uh, so I've been at Sacred Heart University previous to this and then Wayne State prior to that. And uh, yeah, so when I had been pushing the editors to push AACE for a long time to get a copy editor. And when they finally actually managed to secure one, because uh, that is, if you don't have one, the biggest task that an editor has to do is uh, the hours of copy editing. So uh, when they finally got one, uh, Jared guilted me into um, applying to be the new associate editor. And, and I was happy with that because um, in the past they've had co-editors and, and um, I was um, more interested in playing a supporting role to, to help Mary out and, and let her take the lead on the journal. Um, so that's sort of how we, we came to be. Uh, so just to give you a sense, the, the journal publishes three types of articles, and I'll focus upon one of them because that's the one that's more of interest, I think, to you guys, but it's useful to know all three of them. Um, so there's a research section, which basically is your traditional uh, research study type things. So for those of you that might be doing, say, a master's thesis or particularly a doctoral dissertation and you want to do the more traditional six section journal article kind of route, that's really the what the research section is designed to do. Uh, the international section, um, over the first five to six years, I think, actually we're in year, what, seven now, Mary? Yes. Okay, so in the first six years, I think there's been like a total of, uh, I believe it's five articles now, it might be six that had an international focus. Uh, keeping in mind that we publish say three times a year, sometimes four um, in the early years, and there's usually anywhere from three to six articles in each issue. Um, so if you do the math, there are five or six that have a focus outside of the United States is not a good uh, mix for us. So we created this international section, which is uh, still goes through the double blind peer review process. Um, but the reviewers that we have for that section have different levels of expectation for it. Um, the one that's probably of most interest to the DLAC audience is the new one that we actually have just launched this year, uh, the Practitioner Corner one. And that's one that's more designed for um, they tend to be short articles. They are not, uh, they don't go through the regular double blind peer review process. They do an editorial review where we'll get a review from someone who's a topical expert in, in the area. Um, but basically they're designed for things where you've done something in your classroom that you've actually collected systematic data about and you've come to some conclusions about it didn't work or it did work and here's the things that went well and here's the things that done. And, you know, here's what I would recommend to folks in the future. And here's what I would do uh, if I could do it again. Here's what I'm going to change about my practice uh, based upon what I've learned. And obviously not all of those things, um, but focusing upon sort of, you know, one or two of those things. 
um, specifically, and if you go to the, the journal website, uh, this is what you'll be seen with here. But the articles, basically, we're looking for something that's at least a thousand words. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, page length, that's roughly three pages is the minimum. Um, 3,500 words is the maximum. So that would be about 10 pages would be the maximum. But these are designed to be sort of, you know, quick hits. So uh, for those of you, for example, and I know my own students are, are like this, um, our master's program doesn't have a traditional thesis, it has a capstone. Um, but the capstone is contains a lot of the components of the old thesis and it's still probably, you know, 25 to 40 page document. You know, if you get rid of all the academic ease out of that capstone, you probably have about eight to 10 pages of, you know, something you could essentially hand to a colleague. Right. So and that's kind of what we're looking at here. And if you look at kind of the sections that we're we're thinking that it could look like, you know, telling us a little bit about the context and where you're actually to, you know, so what kind of of, of online or blended program was this implemented in? You know, what was the, the type of students that you're working with? You know, were they uh, gen ed students? Were they, you know, special ed students? Were they credit recovery students? Were they accelerated students? Was it an elementary school or a, a high school class? Those kinds of things. Um, you know, what were you hoping to, you know, what was the problem you were hoping to address? Um, what did you actually do? And then based upon any systematic data you have, how did it actually go? And then finally, what'd you learn? You know, what did you take away from, from that uh, experience? And again, it's, it's designed to be something that if you can imagine something that you've done in your classroom that you're particularly proud of, if you could hand somebody at DLAC a three to 10 page paper and said, this is what I did, you should go and do it in your own classroom. That's kind of what we're looking for with this practitioner corner, because you guys are doing a lot of innovative and creative things that never really get pushed out into the, the wider audience, both in terms of the research audience, but also in terms of the practitioner audience, because we're also hoping that this would be a place that you guys could come and see what others are doing. You know, I'm having a problem getting I don't know, getting the majority of my students to participate in the online discussion. Let's go to, you know, JOLR and see if there's anyone who's, you know, done a project on that and, and, and what they did to see what kind of success they had so I can get some ideas. So that's kind of what we're hoping out of this. Um, so there's the uh, journal website and I'll drop it in in the chat in a second. And there are our email addresses and I'll drop those in in the chat as well. Um, but that's sort of the formal part of our presentation. Whoops, didn't mean to take that away from you. So I am going to um, stop sharing now. And basically, you know, this, like I said, we designed it to be an informal session so that you guys could ask us some questions. Um, yes, Heather, the slides are actually already up. Let me drop the link for those. So I'll let Mary talk now while I start dropping links into the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we, we're super interested in, in helping practitioners publish pieces, either as longer articles or shorter ones. So what, are, what kinds of things are you all working on right now? So have you, are you working on formal degrees? Or are you just working in programs and would like to share it? So you can put it in the chat or talk on the mic. So what questions do you have? Hi. Hi. My name is Audrey um, and I am an English teacher at um, an alternative program. And so I was just looking, I joined the chat today, or joined the session today to sort of learn about the Journal of Online Learning. K-12 is very new for me. I came from higher ed and I am looking for a research journal to do some publications, but I don't have really the time or the resources to do the research I'd like to do, if that makes any sense. So I joined um, to hear more about the practitioner corner. Excellent. Yeah, I was an English language arts teacher before I before I went into higher ed, actually. Okay. So I started out doing ESL, actually, English as a second language, and then yes. I took up English language arts <laughs> alongside <laughs> that. And then I went and got a reading endorsement and I worked sort of in the class. It's kind of a weaving lane between 
um, going in and out of special education, but also there's um, there's English learners in that class, and then students with just limited education. And so, mm -hmm. so I think I think we're kindred spirits. <laughs> yes, it seems so. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think there's lots of stuff to write about in terms of um, in terms of English language arts and trying to do blended learning, you know, with those with students and um, issues about. Uh, routines and curriculum and lots of things that you could share. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I noticed in the chat, Heather has indicated that uh, she just finished up at UGA, which is actually where I did my uh, doctorate. So um, my guess is, is that uh, you probably had some of the same faculty uh, with the master's in instructional design as I had with the, the doctorate in instructional technology. Although I know a lot of them have retired or moved on, um, the ones that I had. So, but uh, yes, and Audrey, I mean, one of the things you mentioned about, you know, the time, one of the nice things about the practitioner corner is, um, you know, it, it's really, designed for folks that don't have the time to go and do formal research. You know, the the really the only thing I think that the practitioner corner stuff does that um, would require you to do something that you're not already doing is a little bit of systematic data to figure out whether or not what you tried worked. Because really, I mean, again, what you can probably sit down, you know, today and, and in 10 minutes, write a paragraph that tells me a little bit about your school and your class. When you decide that, okay, I'm, you know, I've got this problem I want to think, again, you could probably, it will only take you, my guess is about 10 or 15 minutes to write a paragraph that says, you know, this is the problem that I'm having that I want to try to figure out. Um, taking a little bit longer, maybe a couple, three paragraphs to say, this is what I actually tried. You know, this is, uh, you know, I went and did X and then I did X, you know, and describe it in sort of a level of detail that, you know, that Heather or, or, or Ian could actually replicate it in their classroom. All right. So, and, and if you have things that you've created online that they can use instead of, you know, wasting time and energy describing it, you know, just summarize it in a couple of sentences and put a link there so that then they can see what it was you actually, you know, if you created content or if you used a specific program, you know, that they've got access to it. And then, you know, this is the the, the bit of the, the, the lift. It's because once you've done the intervention, how do you know whether or not it worked or not other than just your gut feeling, right? And that's sort of the only thing that you're probably not already doing. Um, although depending upon the type of program and you you might have this, like if you think about, you know, a lot of you are probably using learning management systems or other online tools that track usage and data and, you know, that kind of thing. In some cases, it might just be sitting down and taking a little bit more of a systematic look to see, okay, which, you know, data do I already collect that I can use to determine whether or not this particular item is, is, has, you know, had an impact on, on my students. Um, and then basically, you know, the, the lessons learned thing is a paragraph or so, but essentially if you had to do it all over again, or if you were advising the, the teacher next door to you, how to go about doing it, what would you tell them? You know, so it's designed to be something that, that you could do with a minimal amount of effort on your end, but still producing things that, you know, are quite valuable because I imagine, you know, all of you guys are, are you know, pr practitioners in the field. And um, other than, you know, people who blog about, you know, this is what I did in the classroom or attending a conference like DLAC, there's really not too many, uh, you know, there's really no centralized repository where you can go to and see, you know, here's some strategies folks have tried in one of these classrooms and how it went. Other thoughts or ideas or questions that folks might have for us? Michael, do you want to talk for a minute about um, the like IRB or ethical considerations and how those differ in the practitioner corner from a regular research article sure um basically i mean uh, the 
all of the ethical aspects when it comes to research come down from either federal or state guidelines, in most cases, federal guidelines. Um, and in most cases, it focuses around protecting the individual and making sure that, um, well, to, to, to use the medical terminology, that we do no harm. Um, and harm doesn't necessarily have to be physical or even psychological for that matter. Um, one of the issues that often comes up with um, student research, and by student research, I mean, for me, I'm thinking, you know, folks that are teaching that are in my master's program or in my doctoral program. Uh, so graduate student research, if you will. So folks like you, practitioners in the classroom, um, is the fact that you guys have a fair amount of authority over the the students that you work with, you know, you give them grades, you, you know, I, I guess for that matter, you have the ability to assign, you know, punishment and those types of things. So um, those are aspects that you would want to um, keep in mind as you are moving forward with these, uh, because we are, uh, you know, because these things would be published. Um, while you wouldn't have to go through a regular institutional review board type situation, you should still follow the regular practices that that would imply. Um, now, if you're in a graduate program, my guess is your university will require you to to go through that as part of your master's or capstone uh, or doctoral thesis anyway. But for those of you that are just practicing, you know, teachers that you want to engage in this, you know, things like allowing students to opt out making sure that the parents know that you're actually you know looking to publish some of the data around what you're doing um, so you want to sort of you know send a quick note home that that and not through the kids um, that's actually one of the things that the federal guidelines say um, when you communicate things to the um, parent or guardian of a minor it can't be through the minor um, so you know sending note home or um, or uh, an email directly to the parents that say, look, I'm doing this project in my class, you know, because I think it's going to, you know, help me do X. Um, I'm going to be collecting a little bit of data on it and I might publish it in, you know, this particular journal. Um, if you have any questions, you know, contact me here. Uh, if you don't want your child to participate, they'll still be a part of this. I just won't use their data in the actual article. Um, you know, so essentially they still get the benefit of the fact that you're doing this particular strategy or trying out this particular tool, um, but they have the ability to opt out of, of what uh, you're doing. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind as you're going through. And if you have any questions on that, Mary and I are more than happy to, to sit down and sort of plan out anything that you might need to do uh, to help with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because some some stuff would not that you would write about may not fall under um, IRB for various reasons, because like you're not putting a specific student's data up, you're not engaging in the type of analysis that you would like if you were doing a master's thesis and then, you know, teachers are allowed to talk about their experiences and share their curriculum and have it and it's not re considered research. So, because in order to be considered research, it's got to be like some aim of generalizability and, you know, so there's some things around there too that, you know, may not, for whatever reason, may not apply. And so, um, and different school districts have different policies. So I worked with some folks in Fairfax, Virginia, for instance, and the principals are the the only really gatekeeper. <laughs> so, so as long as you want to work in your own classroom, the only person you have to ask is your principal. And if your principal says yes, then you send a note home in case somebody would like to opt out and then you can just do it. But um, in other school districts, then they have, there's more formal processes to it. So I think it never hurts just to, just to run it by somebody and make sure. So a lot of times schools, their districts, their hesitancies are, are revolve around them not wanting to bring criticism on themselves. But we're not asking people to do that. We're asking you to talk about things that work and that will make you look good. <laughs> so you want to emphasize those things like, oh, I want to share aspects of my practice that I think are working well. And then, um, you know that but but for some reason some administrators have a notion of research as being like intentionally like you know 
the condemning or like you're playing a journalism game where you're trying to investigate what's wrong and do an expose and like that's <laughs> we are not asking anybody for that so we're asking people to talk about successes you've had and things that you think are useful and if they're really really nervous about it you could always be a large urban high school in the american southeast or you know yeah. a, a small rural middle school in the american midwest or something like you know i mean that's you know that's the 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 academic speak of how we blind uh, institutions or, or organizations when they don't want to be specifically identified um now the assumption will be in as, as it is when any faculty member writes about you know a, something going you know i i did it at a a, a small faith-based institution in california which is, i wonder <laughs> what one that was um probably the one he works for uh, you know, so, <laughs> Uh, that's a common thing. Uh, the other thing that I, I mentioned as well, uh, or if I got to mention, sorry, uh, data that your school is already collecting as a matter of course um, is already exempted from IRB. So if your students are already doing things like, um, well, Audrey, to use your example, you know, with being an English language arts teacher, it, I can't remember what level you said you're at, but if you're saying the, the elementary levels, I know there's a lot of literacy testing that districts just do and they do it every year and it's just a part of the normal course of what they do. Uh, that type of data you don't have to get permission to use because it's just part of what ends up getting collected while you're in the high school. Um, so statewide assessments and, and the, the results that come back from your state exams. Um, again, that's something the kids do just as, you know, because they're a student in your course in your school and they sort of, you know, just have to do it. All of that data is, is available to use without having to ask anyone's, well, without having to get student or parent permission for it. Uh, so if it's something that they're doing just all the time anyway, mm -hmm. you don't have to ask about those things. Yeah, particularly if it's not identifiable. So if you're just using a, you know, here's the class average. Nobody can tell what an individual student got. So, any other questions, folks, have for us, or, or ideas that that they're wondering, or um, I, I guess if you don't have anything on that, you've got two editors here, both of whom have been in mm -hmm. doing research in the field now for collectively, I guess, probably about four decades if you're to add both of us up together, because I'm guessing you're getting close on 12, 15 years in the field now, Mary. Yeah, I'm getting up there. <laughs> so, um, you know, anything else that, you know, maybe, you know, we do have 10 minutes left. So if you don't have anything else about the journal that you, you'd like to know, um, you know, we're here to answer questions in general. not seeing anything come into the chat but feel free to grab the mic if you want or drop it in the chat are you trying to say something audrey i can't or maybe you're talking to somebody else no I, actually you know of course you know i myself you're know, fiddling around with technology today I'm trying to determine we are new to the conference. Um, our entire building um, is participating virtually, even though it's in Atlanta, we um, were not we weren't sure if we could get subs because, as everybody knows, you know, there's an employee issue across the world right now. So I was trying to determine how to get access to the journal. So that's what I was fiddling with. Sorry. And talking to myself. So sorry. <laughs> The yeah, well, that, that's real. actually a good point. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good point. So this journal is 100% um, free and open access. So sometimes academic journals have um, gates around them that where you got to do a paywall, and this isn't like that. It is absolutely free. You can give it to anybody you want. You can post it anywhere you like. So you can give it to all of your colleagues. <laughs> you can send it to your mom. You can. <laughs> you can total. You totally have charge of it and you can give any article out of a journal to anybody and so um if you're able to go into the link do we want, let me see if i can i'll pull see if i can pull up the journal actually so 
and I'll share my screen. And for folks who came late, I'll drop the URL back in the chat again. So if you go to the link, then this is what comes up. And then here's my name and here's Michael's name and they you can get our contact information. You can actually sign up for new issue alerts. So when there's a new issue, it'll tell you. Um, here's the author guidelines that has the, some of the information that we went over. And then if you go to current issue, then um, here it is. So the last, volume seven, number three, the last issue we published was in December. We have another one coming out in March. And then if you, you can go to any of these articles and here you can view just the abstract, you can actually, I think you can view it here too, but you can go and look at the abstract. Here's the citation. Um, but then also you can go to full text over here and see how it downloads it for me. And then here it is. And you can save this PDF and you can send it wherever you'd like. Um, also, I think open URL, clicking on that one over here. And, um, and so you can look at the different articles that way. So here, this will take you back to the table of contents. So, but if you want the full text, you know, if you want to go look at the whole article, then pull up the full text over here. Um, now, here's actually, here's some work that people did from Georgia. I saw there's somebody from Georgia here. So here's Michael and I's introduction. Also, you can get the full issue. Let's see, used to be able to get the full issue. They've been making some updates to our website in the past couple of months, so it's not quite behaving the way in which we've, we've yeah. become used to. <laughs> and see, and here's actually past issues as well. And these are also all, um, you know, anything in the archive is completely available for you to download and use whatever you'd like. So for instance, this one is a special issue about um, inclusion in online learning environments. And you can just, you can view the abstract or you can go look at the whole article. So you can post it to Twitter or Instagram or whatever, whatever social media you use. So that's, that's how that works. We've got another couple of minutes if folks had any questions. Um, you know, even if this is not something that you're interested in in doing yourself, um, you know, let your colleagues know, uh, let other folks know at the um, at the conference, both Mary and I had to present virtually because uh, I can't, I'm not sure about Mary, but I know I'm not allowed to travel yet um, at my university, they're not permitting anything that's not essential and apparently DLAC in their view is not essential travel. Mm -hmm. um, I beg to differ personally, but that's just me. Um, so, but uh, 
Yeah, so like if you attend, if you're at the site at the event and you attend a session, or you see one of the other virtual sessions that you know kind of you know meets the 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 bill kind of thing, they're you know doing something creative in their classroom, and and you got something out of it, you know, let them know about the the practitioner corner and and the fact that they can submit to to these. So you know, let your colleagues know, let other attendees know, um, you know, when you're at other professional events. Uh, you know, let the folks at those events know. Um, it's a brand new section that that literally is just being launched. Uh, my guess is we probably won't have anything in the first issue uh, because the March issue was pretty much finalized by uh, mid fall in terms of the, the numbers that we had, I'm guessing. Um, you know, we could probably squeeze something in if we got it like very quickly. Uh, but in all likelihood, the our summer issue, which usually comes out in July or August, usually in August, um, is probably the, the first issue that we might have one of these in here. Mm -hmm. Yes, so please, please email us and I'll put my email in the chat again and um, also Mike, Michael can and let us know what your ideas are and how we can connect with you and how we can support you in doing this. All right. Well, we can give you two minutes back of your time. And for the, I don't know if anyone here is presenting in the second session, but if you are, uh, Mary, you want to stop the recording so that way they can get a clean mm -hmm. recording of their bit. All and, right. And uh, uh, Mary and I will log out, which means that uh, the presenters from the next session can claim their host using the key uh, that uh, Kate would have sent along. Thank you much, everyone. Hope to hear from you.